uh, you, you watch the video and as I was saying, the I didn't want this video to be extremely long about the alternative methods. The reason why I, I did this one is because there are, it, it's important that you know that these, these methods existed and that you know that these methods sometimes claim to be perfect or to be a miracle method or to be the solution to language learning, but actually they're not, okay? I'm not saying they're wrong, they're not bad. There are a lot of great things to use from total physical response, especially. Uh, I also totally agree with the principles of the silent way, even though I don't think the practices are interesting. I think the principles are interesting and the, the practices of the total physical response are really useful if you have beginner learners. It's definitely something you can do. But the problem with all these methods is this thinking that one method is going to solve the problem. It's not, okay? In general, you can uh, remember that sadly, or, or, or hopefully, I don't know, but there is the, the fact that teaching a language in school is complicated. Yeah, it is difficult. It's not always working as we would like it to work, but the solution will not come from a magical method that will solve all our problems suddenly. It's, a, it's complicated and we need to be aware that it's complicated. We need to have some processes to, to follow certain principles and some methods can help, but no method is perfect. And even today, we are going to talk about the dominant method, the one that has been dominant for the last 40 years. So for the last 40 years, people have been teaching, uh, saying that they were using some communicative language teaching approach. Um, the reason why this method is actually such long lasting and is still dominant is because it's also very flexible, which is something positive because we need a lot of flexibility because it's not the same teaching a certain group of students and another group of students from a different age, a different country, a different language, a different setting, a different habits, etc. Uh, it's important that you are able to adapt to a certain group of learners. And that's why communicative language teaching is interesting because it's flexible, but because it's also flexible, we find a lot of different things inside of it, which are not always as communicative as they should. But yeah, we'll talk about this in a minute. If you have any question, please interrupt me or write it in the chat. So I will shortly give you an introduction about the communicative language teaching, and then we will do the typical team-based learning approach where we will have the individual test and the team-based test and, um, and then some discussion, okay? So about communicative language teaching, the most important thing to understand is that it's not as strict as a method, it's more a kind of approach, okay? When you looked at the audio lingual method, for example, it really was a fixed set of procedures. You had to do the, a certain number of sets, steps, sorry, in the same order. So you would always first read a dialogue or speak by, I mean, read aloud a dialogue, and then you would have the students uh, listen and repeat each sentence of the dialogue and then you would have some kind of uh, drills and also some kind of practice repeating the dialogue in a more autonomous way etc cetera, etc cetera. and th so you would always have the same steps for every lesson communicative language teaching is not like that you don't have a list of steps so you have really many different ways to uh, to approach this approach to do it um, which is good and also bad, as I was saying. The most important part about the communicative language teaching approach is the principles. Now, you already know these principles from reading uh, the Larson and, Freem Larson, uh, Larson, Freeman and Anderson book uh, about communicative language teaching. But in general, three things to remember. First, the idea that, of course, communicative language teaching, the objective is to learn how to communicate in the language. It's the objective, it's what we want the students to be able to do at the end, but it's also the process. So it's both the end and the process, the, the product and the process. The product is being able to communicate and how you will reach that by having the students communicate. So how do you learn in a communicative way? By having the students communicate, by having the students read, listen, write, and speak. That's 
what they have to do. They have to communicate and talk to each other, write to each other, listen to each other uh, in order to really develop the language. That's the key idea here. If you want them to learn how to communicate, they have to communicate. Second thing, rather than giving the, than organizing the learning in terms of grammar or vocabulary units. So typically, if you look at audio lingual or grammar translation, you typically have an organization in terms of grammatical units or of vocabulary units, what we could call structures. But here, the communicative language teaching method will not be organized in terms of units, it will be organized in terms of functions. What are functions? Uh, what you do in the language. So when you greet someone, when you say hello, that's a function, saying hello, greeting. When you introduce yourself, hi, my name is Serge, I'm a teacher. That's also uh, something you do with the language. When you ask for something, can you pass me the salt, please? That's also a function. When you give an advice, give a recommendation, when you write a letter to something, you do some, you take part in a negotiation, etc. All these are functions. Uh, if you remember from ling any kind of linguistics class, you probably heard about the speech acts theory by Austin and Searle. So the speech acts are the same idea as functions. It's exactly the same idea. The reason why we are talking about functions and not speech acts is because sometimes when we look at speech acts, it's a little bit more restricted. Functions, it's a little bit more uh, flexible, but the idea is the same, okay? So speech acts, functions. I hope it is clear. If you have any question or something is not clear, tell me. Okay, so that's what we call the functional notional syllabus because it's functions and notions. Notions, I don't think it's so useful. I really think the interesting thing here is in terms of functions. So we will really focus on functions. And the last principle, the last, in my opinion, at least, the key idea of the, the communicative language teaching approach is that to enable this communication to be happen in the classroom, we have to do peer interaction. So what it means peer interaction is talking to each other, talking, the students talking with other students. It may not look. It may not. It may not look completely revolutionary. But actually, if you look at most classrooms, especially grammar translation classrooms or even audio lingual classrooms, most of the interaction is between the teacher and the students, not be, not the, among the students together. It's between the teacher and the students. And, and what is the problem of having? What is the main limitation of this interaction being only? between the teacher and the students. Can you tell me? What is the limitation of that? Why is it problematic? Why is it not enough? Anybody? Yeah, Fabrizio? Um, maybe during these methods, the students doesn't learn, and the student doesn't learn the real English. Uh, Why? Because the teacher is not talking English perfectly? So maybe, maybe the students don't produce nothing, only listen. Yeah, that's the problem. Yeah, they don't produce enough. They don't talk enough. And that's the main problem in almost any classroom if you do not do peer interaction. So if the teacher is the only one organizing the interaction. First, the teacher is talking a lot, and then he is asking a few students. So, uh, okay, I, I, I. first, it will always be a few students that will participate, not all of them. I know that if I ask you a question, I, I know that some of you, like Fabrizio, will answer, but not all of you. And even if you want it, you would not have time to be able to answer all of you. And even if, let's say that, all of you actually answer one of my questions. And at the end, everyone has talked a little bit. But at the end, what you have, will have talked is talked for a few seconds, everyone. Because, well, there is just one person talking at a time. If you do peer interaction, so basically 
I'm putting Fabricio and Esther, uh, Veronica and, and Roy together in a small group and I'd say, okay, right now talk about what you think about peer interaction. And, and all the other groups are talking at the same time and this multiplies by 10, by 20 sometimes, the time allowed, allocated to speaking practice for the students. So that the, if there is one key element about this communicative language teaching that you have to remember is that if you want the students to learn how to communicate, you need them to talk with in smaller groups uh, at the same time, multiple groups, so that you need to have interaction between the students. That's the key element. That's really the key element. Any question about this? I hope this is clear. So beside these principles, uh, well, yeah, just remind, rem reminder, there was also the video about the teaching, the communicative approach the demonstration video. I hope you watched it uh, and you understood how it was kind of different. You, you probably saw there that there was a lot of time dedicated to smaller groups, this discussion and not just repeating the dialogue that's very important not as in dialogue uh, the audio lingual method there you would have this repetition of the dialogue but it's not really communicative practice it's just repeat repetition <coughs> it's just a kind of mechanical activity in the communicative language teaching method you really have to talk to each other and that's the key uh, in terms of activities what does it look like well the the one famous activity about the early communicative language teaching is information gap. Um, so information gap, this, is, this means an activity where you give two students typically a different piece of information and they have to talk to each other to solve it, to do the activity. So you have different options there. Uh, the, an example, a typical example is you give one student a, a shopping list and the other student you give them an inventory list for a shop. So one is the client, the other one is a shopkeeper. The key idea is that they do not see the list of the other, so they have to talk in order to know what they can buy. And so the, the one guy will say, oh, I would like a, a milk, please. I would like a, a, a one liter of milk, a can of milk or something. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't have milk, but I have cream. Do you, are you interested in cream? Oh, no, not really. Okay, so that's, that's a, a, a information gap task. More typical even of a more information gap task is a, a picture, a spot the differences task. So you give two pictures, one, one picture to each person. You know these activities where you have to spot the differences between two, two pictures, right? Now, you take the two pictures, you cut them in half. Well, I mean, you cut, you give one picture to one student, you give the other picture to another student. And now what they have to do is they have to talk because they cannot see the, the picture of, of the other person. They have to talk to decide, to find out the differences. So, oh, something like, Oh, uh, on my uh, drawing, there is a tree and next to the tree, there is a man. Oh, on mine, the, I also have a tree, but next to the tree, it's not a man, it's a woman. Okay, so that's an, an information gap task. If in order to find, to spot the differences, you have to uh, really uh, discuss it and do it. Now, it's a very famous activity of the communicative language teaching, but it's not so perfect in itself. I, I, it's not something that is so common right now. It was very common in the early years of like in the 80s and 90s. These days, it's a little bit less important. We can still do things like that, but it's not that it's so different from all, all the other activities such as uh, role plays and simulations. Do you know the difference between a role play and a simulation? What is the difference between a role play and a simulation? Does somebody know? I don't know. Maybe in simulation, the students, uh, the students prepare their own dialogue. Uh, in both, they should say their own dialogue. But there is one thing that in, in what you said that is very important is 
and, and not in the fact that they should do it, is they should not do that. Um, there is one error, very, very common error in many classrooms is that the teachers tell the students prepare a dialogue and then present this dialogue. This is not speaking, this is writing. If you prepare a dialogue, what you're actually doing is you're speaking in Spanish to the other person and you're saying, oh, ¿qué vamos a decir ahora? Uh, vamos a decirle, ah, hello, hello. Vamos a escribir, hello. And then you will practice, you will, hello, hello, mister, how are you? Oh, I am very well, thank you. Uh, and that's not speaking, that's writing. So do never, never ask them to prepare a dialogue. Ask them to do the dialogue immediately without writing anything, without thinking too much, just do the dialogue. Don't, you're not writing a, a, a play, you're not writing a theater piece, a piece, sorry, a theater please, piece. Ah. <laughs> you're not writing a piece of theater. You're writing, you you're, have to speak like if you were in a situation right now. So role play, do not ask them to write down something and simulation is the same now what is the difference between role play and simulation maybe someone else knows well the sorry the key idea is is here in both cases there is a kind of dialogue in both cases there is a dialogue the only difference is is that in the role play, students play a role. In the simulation, they do not play a role. So basically they are themselves. Um, a role play would be something like, okay, um, let's play, let's do a role play. It, let's do groups of two. So for example, I will start with an example with uh, Brian and uh, Diana, and you have to talk together. Brian, you will be, I don't know, a lawyer, and Diana, you're a criminal. And you're a criminal who has been, sus or at least a suspected criminal of committing a crime. I don't know, you murdered someone, or maybe you just did some kind of corruption. Uh, I don't know. And you have to talk to your lawyer to prepare your defense in front of the judge. So of course, it's, these are roles. Uh, hopefully Diana is not a criminal and, and hopefully also Brian is not a lawyer because it's kind of boring to be a lawyer. So um, they're playing a role and they're imagining their role and they're doing their role. Oh yeah, Mr. Law, uh, uh, what, what do we say to the lawyers in English? I'm not sure. Somewhat Mr. or doctor. No, I don't think you, you say doctor. Uh, well, in any case, <laughs> she will be talking to the lawyer and expressing Oh, uh, uh, no, I, I, I'm really innocent. You know, I, I didn't do that. I didn't do this thing they, 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 they say they'll, I, that I did, etc. In a simulation, you're also doing a dialogue, but you're playing your own character. So again, if we take the example of Diana and Brian, we'll say, okay, let's do a simulation. Let's say that Brian and Diana meet in the street. It's been five years since they have left the, the, the university they meet again in five years in the street. Oh, Diana, how are you? Oh, uh, Brian, it's been such a long time. How have you been? Uh, tell me about your life. What, what are you doing now? Oh, you know what? I'm a teacher, etc. Et okay, so that's a simulation because it's not real, but it's not a role play because you're playing your own role. That's the difference between the two. Both are fine, okay? There's not, there's not one which is better than the other. It's just that they allow you to do different things. Okay, you, you want do, to do both. Interviews, uh, also kind of a kind of simulation as well, an interview, of course. Group work, any kind of work where you will be discussing in the group. But again, the key idea here is that the discussion in the group has to happen in, in, in English, not in Spanish, in the language you're learning. Because what you're interested in is not the product of the group work, is also and mostly in the discussion within the group. So, for example, you can do some kind of group work where uh, every group will prepare, I don't know, uh, prepare um, a stand or a presentation for an open house event. You know, an open house. 
uh, so do you have to prepare something now the interesting thing is not so much the open house it's the preparation but for the preparation to be really interesting it has to be done in english so you have to talk in english it's it's not easy at the beginning but you, you really have to insist that the students have to talk in english all the time but that's the key uh, opinion sharing that's basically just having a debate in the class oh what do you think about i don't know what do you think about uh, vaccines who here is going to uh who, who is planning who here is planning on receiving the vaccine against the coronavirus uh, maybe nobody because we know that we are young and we want to receive it before i don't know one year <laughs> something like that uh, hopefully if we receive anything um, but so that would be opinion sharing everyone gives its opinion debates basically in the class or in smaller group as well scavenger hunt it's the idea that uh, you're doing a uh, yeah, treasure hunt or scavenger hunt. Basically, you're looking for information. Again, what is interesting here is the talking in English part. What is something you typically do like that in, in a classroom is uh, you ask all the students to stand up. So they have to move around the classroom and they have to find people who have certain characteristics. So find someone in the class who has five brothers and sisters find someone in the class who doesn't live with their parents find someone in the class who has been recently on holiday to the beach or something like that and so what all the students they have to go and and walk around the, the classroom and say oh how many child, uh, how many uh, si brothers and sisters do we have oh you don't have any brother and sister so definitely not you okay let me find someone else how many brothers and sisters do you have and oh uh, and have you recently been on vacation to the beach etc etc et so that would be a scavenger hunt again the objective is the discussion that's really what we are interested in at the end we don't really it's not really important if you found or not the the person who has five brothers and sister the important thing is you have discussed and asked question to all the other people. You see my point? Any question about these activities? So these are really uh, interesting things that you can do in the class. In a, in a virtual setting, it's slightly more limited. But you can still do, you know, breakout rooms and then role plays, simulations, interviews, group work, opinion sharing in a small group or opinion sharing with the whole class. It's just a little bit difficult to have responses these days from you <laughs> as well as uh, English students. But yeah, that's it. Any question? Okay, one last key idea about the communicative language teaching approach is that there is a kind of communicative continuum. So what do I mean by that? Well, the, you remember that this is an approach. It's not really a fixed set of techniques and procedures. It's kind of flexible. And because it's flexible, there are various interpretations of it. Uh, actually, most people, most teachers, if you ask them, they will tell you that they're doing some kind of communicative language teaching method. The problem is that they can do very different things within the same idea of communicative language teaching. For example, if what they ask from their students is repeat a textbook dialogue. So, you know, at the beginning of most textbooks, not this one, but the, the typical textbooks for beginners and intermediate students, you, you get these dialogues at the beginning of many units. Um, these dialogues, these dialogues are not bad at all, but if what you, what you do is asking your students just to repeat and practice the dialogue in front of the class, for example, that is not very communicative. It, I, I'm not saying it's completely grammar translation or audiolingual. It looks kind of audiolingual, but it's a very weak communicative language teaching method. Because if they're just practicing the dialogue, they're not learning how to express ideas they're just reading out loud a dialogue or memorizing a dialogue and reading it out loud. loud. So if you, on, the, on the contrary, you are asking them to immediately on their seat, start talking to each other, that is 
much more communicative. And also you realize that um, in this communicative setting, you're not asking them to prepare something and then present in front of the class, right? That's something I almost never do with my students. I do not see the point of presenting in front of the class because if they present in front of the class, they are kind of stressed. They are more afraid to do a mistake. So because of that, they will tend to memorize, write down what they will say, etc. And that we do not want that. We want them to talk right now at this very moment. So don't ask them to present in front of the class. So in summary for this, you have a, a continuum from weak communicative language teaching to strong communicative language teaching. What we are more interested, of course, is strong communicative language teaching. This, this table gives you five different stages. So a non-communicative stage where you would focus totally on language structures and on grammar exercise, that is not even communicative at all. You are focusing on forms. We will talk about focus on forms another day, but that's the idea. Uh, so, oh, sorry about this. So this, this uh, non-communicative, that's, that's really totally, um, uh, yeah, not, not communicative. That's grammar translation or something like that. Now, if you're practicing language with some attention to meaning, so you're not asking them to just repeat the dialogue, but you're, or maybe you're asking them to repeat the dialogue or to, you do some kind of question and answer practice. You ask, ask them question, they answer. Uh, what's your name? My name is Serge. Where are you from? I'm from Quito or I'm from Belgium or whatever. That would be, it depends on a little bit on the setting, but that would be a kind of weak communicative language teaching, especially if there is not a lot of attention to form. What you're really asking them is to say something using the simple present, for example. If you say something using the simple present, well, you're asking them to say something. So there is a little bit of meaning, but mostly it's you're worried about forms. That would be pre-communicative. Now, communicative practice with where you're practicing pre-taught language to communicate new information. So you have already uh, focused still on, on specific forms and you're telling them, you know, use these forms that we learned to express something and typically do that in an information gap. That's the classical communicative language teaching. It's not bad, but it's not the best that you can do. Then you have structured communication. That's all already going a bit further because there is, it's still communicate with pre-learned language, but there is some unpredictability. So for example, a structured role play where you say, okay, you will be, um, you will be the, the, the shopkeeper and you will be the, um, the client. And I'll give you some instructions, but you have some uncertainty, some unpre unpredictability about what you have to do. For example, um, you can choose as a client what you want to buy. And so the shopkeeper, if, if, he know already, if he knows already what you're going to buy, it's not really interesting. So that would be more here or there. But if, if the shopkeeper doesn't know what you're going to ask, then it's more interesting. Or simple problem solving, that would be also the case. Now, the most authentic communication you can get is communicating in situations where meanings are unpredictable. So for example, if we do this, uh, this the same role play with the shopkeeper and uh, and uh, the client, but this time the client can really come up with completely unexpected things and can really be creative. And the, the shopkeeper can also suddenly start to be angry and say, oh no, I don't want to serve you anymore. I'm, I'm fed up with those weird asking things that you're requesting from me. Uh, and, and you start to have something more creative, more complex then it starts to become more authentic. And that's a kind of very strong communicative language teaching. But what would be a strong communicative language teaching in general is a task-based language teaching. And that's something we will talk about in the last part of this class is really when you go beyond the simple classic uh, exercises of the communicative approach and you really start to get into tasks and activities that are, have a very profound meaning. We will talk about this later, but you already have some idea from this. Okay, that's what I wanted to say. Any question about the